The Ottoman Empire had risen to become a world power after the wars of conquest against Byzantium, Hungary and the Mamluks of Egypt. The grandsons of Ertuğrul, who had laid the foundation for the empire, achieved fame and power in the process and were perceived above all by European rulers as a great military as well as economic threat. Nevertheless, the glory of the empire had already faded by the 19th century, after the Western European powers colonized America and feasted on the treasures of Africa, the influence of the Ottomans declined. At the same time, Japan was undergoing a completely diametrical development. After centuries of rule by the shoguns, the dictators with military backgrounds, the imperial family once again took direct power. The feudal structures were gradually abolished and thus the feudal society, which had lasted a millennium, was rapidly replaced by modern political institutions. This new Japan was accompanied by many crises, but nevertheless gave birth to a Japanese identity that both respected the old traditions and articulated a new self-confidence. At the same time, a unified Japan established itself as a great power in the international community having dealt severe military blows first to Korea, then to China and especially to the Russian Empire, in the process asserting itself as a colonial power in East Asia. As different as the situations of the two nations appeared towards the end of the 19th century, both Turks and Japanese continued to share commonalities even millennia after emigrating from their common homeland on the Liao River. Firstly, both saw themselves as important civilizations of Asia. Related to this was their aversion to the interventions of foreign, European and American powers in Turkish and Japanese affairs respectively. Secondly, both peoples were living through difficult times. Just as the shrinking of the Ottoman Empire was accompanied by much suffering, so too was the modernization of the Japanese Empire. There were no formal deep political contacts between the two countries until an incident took place that rekindled Turkish-Japanese relations after almost 5000 years. This event possibly created the basis for contemporary relations between the Republic of Turkey and Japan, the Ertrul disaster in 1890. <laughs>The Ottoman Empire had not been called the Ottoman state for the longest time, instead the official name was Devleti Ali, which in Ottoman Turkish means the exalted state. For about four centuries this state controlled Hungary, the Balkans, large parts of North Africa, parts of Arabia and Iran, Crimea and parts of Ukraine and of course the Caucasus. But as mentioned, the empire's territory had shrunk massively by now as more and more countries gradually gained independence from the Ottoman Empire thanks to the financial and political support of European powers as well as by Russia. During this shrinking process, the Turkish heartland of Anatolia became increasingly important. Although the empire continued to control large parts of the Balkans and the Middle East, it found its on the defensive from 1683 at the latest. It fell behind great powers such as England and France, especially in the areas of political and technological revolution and attempts at political reform were repeatedly reversed or postponed. To prevent more regions from falling away from the empire and to initiate the modernization of the state as well as society, a certain sultan ordered a series of reforms. His name was Abdul Mejid, the 31st ruler of the Ottomans. He initiated the so-called Tanzimat era. The Gülhane Edict, which he proclaimed in 1839 and which is named after the park in Eminön in Istanbul, aimed to secularize the law and integrate non-Muslim and non-Turkish residents of the empire. Other measures taken by the Sultan included the introduction of paper money, a reorganization of the Ottoman army, the abolition of slave markets and the strengthening of property rights. Under Abdul Mejid's rule, the Ottomans also attempted to send relief supplies to Ireland during the Great Famine of the 1840s. Ultimately, with these and other actions and legislative changes, the Sultan sought not only to modernize his empire internally, but also, as a consequence, to stabilize it against separatist efforts and protect it against the growing influence of European powers in Ottoman territory. At the same time, he had obviously taken European civilizations as role models for the exalted state. 
But for a group of intellectuals called the Young Ottomans, these reforms did not go far enough. These young men wanted to establish a parliamentary system based on the French model. In 1876, after the deposition and assassination of Sultan Abdulaziz, who by the way managed to make the Ottoman fleet the third largest in the world by 1875, the dream of the intellectual elite was fulfilled with the accession of the new Sultan Abdul Hamid II to the throne. This sultan reluctantly accepted the young Ottoman's proposal so that the first constitution of modern character finally came into force, Kanunu Esasi, the basic law in Turkish. The new constitution was approved by the population, both Muslim and Christian, but some groups rejected it on the grounds that it violated Sharia law. Unfortunately for the Ottomans, the Russia-Turkish War of 1877-78 in Turkish Doksan Birhalbe ended with the defeat of Ottoman troops. Only two weeks after an armistice was signed between the two states, Abdul Hamid seized his chance and suspended the constitution, claiming that he wanted to end the chaos and social unrest in the empire and restore order. Interestingly, there had been no social unrest though. With the suspension of the constitution, the parliament was also dissolved. In a period that has since come to be known as the Istibdat, Abdul Hamid cut many posts in ministries and agencies and increasingly retreated to Yildiz Palace, away from both the intellectuals as well as the general populace. Factors such as the Empire's state default and military defeats at the ends of Russia, as well as rebellions in the Balkans and the secession of Serbia and Montenegro increasingly created a sense of becoming encircled. This pressure probably led Abdul Hamid to become increasingly conservative over the course of his roughly 32-year reign. Then again, while many intellectuals had at first expected Abdul Hamid to become a liberal, modernizing sultan prior to his ascension is beyond me. Seems like the population was tricked by the Sultan. Nevertheless, the modernization of the empire had not ended abruptly. On the contrary, modernization continued on a smaller scale. Around the year 1900, Abdul Hamid had many schools and universities founded in the country. Railroad tracks were also built throughout the empire, which in turn allowed the famous Orient Express to travel from Vienna to Constantinople. At the same time, the Sultan distrusted many in the country. His secret police, the Umuru Hafie, operated throughout the country with the goal of uncovering so-called foreign clandestine activities. The educational system throughout the country was also subjected to careful inspection. This way, Abdul Hamid wanted to prevent any sort of rebellion. This was to spark a hotbed, ironically, which the Turkish heroes of World War I, as well as of the struggle of independence in 1919, emerged. Men like Mustafa Kemal Atatürk who would not repeat these mistakes in the new Republic of Turkey. Abdul Hamid is seen by many today as the ruler who, despite alleged opposition to foreign powers, sold out his own country, the Ottoman Empire, piece by piece to foreign powers and interest groups, especially to Britain and Cyprus, but that is a topic for another video. With these remarks in mind, we now turn our attention towards Japan. Interestingly, a parallel can be seen here, because the Japanese people, like the Turks, were also at the crossroads in the 19th century. For centuries, however, it was not the emperors, the Tenno, who held sway here, but rather the shoguns. The shoguns were de facto autocrats with military backgrounds. The unification of the country had been a result of numerous extremely bloody wars between different clans, similar to the struggle of the Turkish Beyliks in Anatolia. But while the Ottoman Empire saw itself as the third continent between Europe and Asia, Japan experienced a policy of isolation from 1603 onward. For about 260 years, the entire territory inhabited by Japanese was completely isolated from foreign countries. Foreigners were not allowed to enter and Japanese not allowed to leave the country. This Sakoku policy pervaded the entire Edo period, which in turn was characterized by political stability and the promotion of art and culture. A product of this period are the works of Katsushika Hokusai. This animation, for example, corresponds to his most famous painting, The Great Wave. Even more so than the Empire of the Ottomans, Edo society was structured into a very strict hierarchy. After the Emperor and the nobles came the samurai, then the peasants, merchants and so on. But people who followed certain professions, such as those of executioner, butcher and even city guards and street cleaners were called Eta and Hinin, literally dirty and non-humans, 
This admittedly resulted in discrimination that carried over into the 20th century. The Edo era was drawing to a close in the mid-19th century. The most obvious reason is the forced opening of Japanese ports to the American Navy led by Commodore de Perry. Initially, the Americans did not necessarily want to trade with the Japanese, but at least used Japanese ports as bases and hubs for the Navy as well as merchant ships to and from China. The Japanese had no choice but to surrender to the demands of the technologically superior Americans. This humiliation was deeply imprinted on the minds of the Japanese, however, mismanagement on the part of the Shogun also led to the rise of discontent. In summary, revolts occurred repeatedly, especially by the peasantry. In addition, economic problems developed as the opening of Japanese markets not only to American but also to European merchants and traders massively devalued the price of gold in Japan. The country was furthermore flooded by cheap consumer goods from all over the world, which increasingly resulted in bankruptcies of domestic Japanese entrepreneurs. Japan was faced with a directional decision both politically and culturally. Should it abandon resistance altogether and open up completely to the world or fight against the occupiers and seal off the country from the rest of the world once and for all? The answer was neither. In the so-called Boshin War of 1868-1869 to between loyalists and progressive forces, the opponents of the shogunate were victorious. Shortly thereafter, the noble Musuhito stabilized the political situation in the country and founded the new Japanese Empire. Under the name Meiji, he became emperor over all of Japan. As a rather young man, he continued to struggle with interventions by foreign countries, especially the Americans. At the same time, he had to appease the former supporters of the shogunate. However, Meiji saw an opportunity to solve both problems with one swift stroke. He abolished the feudal society one by one. In 1871, the so-called provinces from the old society and with them the Han system were dissolved and Japan was from then on administered in 72 prefectures. Many of the magnates, the daimyos, withdrew from politics. Meiji also curtailed the privileges of the samurai. While Abdul Hamid had dissolved the Ottoman parliament shortly before, Meiji had the Japanese parliament brought to life in 1889. But it was only a sham democracy. Powerful men from the army, politics and business, the so-called Hambatsu, rose to become the new elite in the country. There is much more to be said about the periods of modernization both in the Ottoman Empire and in Meiji Japan, but the contrast should be clear by now. What matters most for our story is that internal dynamics affected the foreign policy stance of both states. And this brings us to the first important encounter between Japanese and Turks after more than 5000 years of separation. The Erdrol had been ordered by Abdul Aziz, built and launched in 1863 in the Tashkusak shipyard in Galata, Istanbul. The ship was named after Erdrol, the father of Osman. You should be familiar with him by now. In autumn of 1878, the sloop Seiki of the Japanese Navy entered Constantinople and was honored by Sultan Abdul Hamid himself. A few years later, in 1881, the diplomat Masaharu Yoshida arrived at the Yildiz Palace. He was on a mission by Emperor Meiji to establish trade agreements with the Ottomans. Shortly thereafter, even Prince Komatsu Akihito arrived in Constantinople. Abdul Hamid used this as a chance to deepen ties with the Japanese and accordingly ordered a ship to go on a goodwill voyage to Japan. The frigate Erturul was assigned for this mission. In 1889, the ship was then ordered by Abdul Hamid, Grand Vizier Kamil Pasha and Naval Minister Hassan Husni Pasha as a training exercise for the recent graduates of the Naval Academy in Istanbul. The ship departed on July 14th under the command of Osman Pasha and Suvade Ali Bey. The frigate had a crew of 609 to 612 men. Its route led through the Marmaris to Port Said, Suez, Jeddah, Aden, Bombay, Colombo, Calcutta, Malacca, Singapore, Saigon, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Nagasaki and was finally to conclude on Yokohama. The estimated time for the journey to Japan and back was 6 months. Quite a journey if you ask me. But after 2 weeks already, the Erdrol encountered very strong winds in the Suez Canal. Its rudder and stern posts were broken. 
Therefore, the crew was forced to rest in Egypt until the ship was fully operational two months later. Could this have been a bad omen for things to come? On September 23rd, the Atro set sail again. And on November 15th, it arrived in Singapore and there lost a mass which forced the crew to once again rest on foreign soil. The crew though, of course, included not only sailors but also high-ranking Ottoman statesmen. Some of them wanted to abort the mission and return to Constantinople and instead send letters and gifts to Emperor Meiji by way of a European postal steamboat. Osman Pasha was also troubled by the typhoon season in Southeast Asia and wanted to hold out even longer before returning to Constantinople. This, however, would have cost Abdul Hamid even more money. The Sultan, in his quest to show his pan-Islamic ambitions, wanted the ship to be seen in as many countries as possible and therefore the journey had to continue. On March 22, 1890, the frigate left the port of Singapore through Saigon and Hong Kong, albeit with many delays on its way. Then, on July 7, the Aotearoa finally reached the shores of Yokohama. It had taken 11 months to finally reach the intended destination. In Yokohama, the crew was received with high honors, but especially Osman Pasha and Reshat Bey were escorted by train to Tokyo. There, they met the emperor and were treated fairly as guests of the imperial court. They even dined with both the emperor and the empress on June 13th. Osman Pasha took a whole month to make official visits with other Japanese statesmen. Both sides were careful, but both Turks and Japanese showed definitive expressions of friendship. The actual catastrophe took place when the Ottoman frigate departed home on September 15, despite warnings by the Japanese about incoming weather conditions that could risk a safe passage by the crew. A day later, the ship sank off the coast of Oshima due to a typhoon. Many men were killed, but 69 of them survived. The survivors approached the lighthouse of Oshima, where they communicated in English with the inhabitants about what had happened. The news spread so fast that the Japanese foreign minister sent a telegraph to Abdul Hamid in Constantinople, offering his condolences for the deceased. But the real story here is how helpful the local population and state officials were towards the Turkish guests. They conducted salvage operations to save ship equipment. In the Japanese media, the Japanese people all over the country were informed about the incident and the newspapers openly displayed their sympathies towards the Turks. In Oshima, the town of the incident, a monument was erected that is still visited today. Japanese warships then escorted the survivors back to Constantinople. Although neither Russians nor the British wanted to watch Japanese ships enter the Dardanelles into the Ottoman capital, due to fear about Japanese geopolitical aspirations, the Japanese captain Tanaka raised his voice, even towards the Sultan, who also wanted to prevent another international incident. Still, he agreed to the alternative. His ship, the Congo, sailed to Izmir, where the survivors were transported via train back home. In the eyes of many academics, the Atoll incident did certainly not mark the first contact between Ottoman Empire and Meiji Japan, but definitely functioned as a catalyst for the establishment of Turkish-Japanese relations. After the Japanese had been successful in their war against Russia in 1904 and 1905, the Turkish elite certainly was interested in a closer relationship with Japan and vice versa. However, as Japan was rising to become a major power in international politics, the Turks feared that any more agreements with them might become a burden for the Ottoman Empire, just as it was with the European colonialist powers. Nonetheless, in 1908, the reign of Abdul Hamid came to an end after the Young Turks coup. This group of young men with Western-leaning education and views most definitely saw the Japanese not just as future trading partners, but as role models. Japan had successfully consolidated rule and modernized itself not only, but mostly, thanks to Emperor Meiji's aspirations. Nearly half a century later, the Japanese were taken much more seriously even by the Americans. Perhaps the Ottomans could have taken the same path. We will take a look at the Young Turk movement at another time and instead conclude with the fact that the Ertel disaster strengthened understanding between Turkish and Japanese people. Next time, we will delve even deeper into Ottoman major relations and take a closer look at the man who behind the scenes was responsible for rapprochement between both nations, Yamada Toradjil.